What's up, good people? My name is AJ, and you are watching Straight Talks. I want to make two qualifying points before I get into the contents of the video here today. Uh, this is a topic that I think is going to have some serious relevance in relation to personal financial planning in the next maybe year, but probably three to five, definitely ten years. Um, and it's a little bit more of a theoretical concept, so this is definitely not something that is geared towards people who are brand new to investing their own money. It's something that I think will carry a little bit more debate amongst people who consider themselves professional investors. So I want to point out a couple things before I start to make the argument that I'm going to make here. In this video, I'm going to make a couple arguments against using indexed investments, which would be like indexed mutual funds or, or ETFs, for some reasons that I think do stand fair ground. But I want to make it clear that I don't think that those things are bad. And actually, I think that they are good for most investors. Warren Buffett talks about the power of indexed funds or ETFs for personal financial planning. Anyone managing their own investments should probably consider those options. And I think for 90 or 95 percent of the population, an indexed mutual fund is the best option that you can choose if you're deciding how to allocate your own dollars in a Roth IRA, 401k, whatever it might be. So I want to make the point clear right away that I think across the board, these are good investment options, but they have some problems. They're not perfect. I think they're problems that have recently emerged in the last handful of years. And so I want to talk about those here. So the general issue here is going to be the concentration of the indexed funds and ETFs amongst the five or handful of largest stocks in the indexes. But the core problem is how they are being presented. These investments are called things like total stock market index, or uh, they are presented as diversified baskets of investments. And Maybe 10 or 20 years ago that was the case, but it has become less and less so as the best performing stocks have also been the largest stocks that are in that index over the past one, three, five years. Depending on when you're watching this video, right now the top five stocks are concentrated into more than a quarter of the index. And so I believe for the S&P 500, it's gonna be like Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and uh, Microsoft. And those five stocks from the most recent numbers I've seen are 26 or 27% of that benchmark. Bless you. When you think about the S&P 500 and when a new investor gets into investing and decides, oh, I want to hold a basket of the 500 stocks in the United States, just by general assumption, you would think about that as uh, getting an exposure to those 500 stocks, when in reality, a quarter of that person's money is going into five stocks and the other chunk of their money is going into the other 495 stock. Especially on the smaller end of that index, meaning stocks maybe 500 to 200, some of them make up like a fraction of a percent of what that index is. Really almost no exposure to that investor's portfolio in that group of stocks and, and much, much more exposure to the top five stocks which I think is something that not a lot of people are cognizant of. Now those five stocks, like I mentioned, that are the biggest in the index have also been some of the top performing stocks in the index. So that is really good for people who are indexed right now. There are almost no active or equally weighted or any other strategies other than cap weighted funds out there that can compete with the performance of the S&P 500 recently because none of them weight the top uh, five stocks as heavily as that index does because it's cap weighted or, or weighted by size. And so with those being the best performers, none of the other strategies have done as well. But that's part of what's leading into this issue is that so many people have gone, oh, well, look how great the stock market does relative to XYZ investment. Uh, it must be better. And so ETFs have seen an unbelievable amount of flows over the last 10 years, partly because of that. Of course, they're lower uh, fee options and they make more sense for some people. But I don't believe that that outperformance is going to persist for long periods of time into the future. There are a lot of studies that can prove that. And there's one in particular that I'm going to read here because I think it's very easy to understand for the general population. And it really illustrates the point that I'm discussing. So I'm going to summarize the study, but also read a couple excerpts from it. But in general, what they did was looked at the S&P 500 from 1964 to 2014, 50 year period. And each year they would pick a random selection of 30 stocks from the index. So 1964, throw 30 darts, pick the random stocks. That's your portfolio for that year. 1965, do it all again, 30 other random stocks. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of overlap from year to year to year, but they did that every year once a year. And so uh, they ran this 100 different times. They ran this scenario where uh, every year from 64 to 2014, they picked 300 random, or sorry, 30 random stocks from the index and measured the performance at the end of that 50 year period, then did it again, 100 times total. And the results of the study were really staggering and, and to me, totally surprising. So this random basket of 30 stocks from the S&P 500 uh, killed the market weighted portfolio in terms of performance. In the 100 simulations they ran, in uh, four of those simulations over the 50 year period, the S&P 500 won. 
in 96 of the 100 simulations, the random basket of 30 stocks won in performance. 96% of the time, and there was no rhyme or reason as to how they picked those 30 stocks. So if you applied a, just a little bit of fundamental investment knowledge towards which 30 you chose, you might even be able to improve your 96% win rate. The numbers were that uh, the portfolio of 30 stocks on average after the 100 trials, uh, let's see, made 11.3% a year, whereas the S&P made 9.7%. Uh, but to illustrate that in U.S. dollar terms, if you invested a thousand dollars, sorry, ten thousand dollars in 1964, by the average results of the 30 random stock portfolio, you'd have 187 thousand dollars at the end of the 50-year period, versus the market, you would have 60, 64 thousand dollars. So you'd have double the money by by investing in this 30 random strategy, and that was just really surprising to me. Of course, in the last five or ten years. The market cap weighted strategy is one, but I think this shows pretty clearly how over longer periods of time that doesn't always hold to be true. When that trend reverses back to the normal and we start to see some of the smaller companies in the index perform better as well as or better than the big ones, I think you're going to see a lot of people who start to be surprised by their performance who were originally sold this uh, this ETF as something that was broadly diversified when really they're they're heavily concentrated in one sector. You might say, well, hey, AJ, what do I do about this? And there are a lot of firms out there who point out this issue that I'm talking about, and they sell a product to help out with it. I honestly don't care too much on which one you go with. There are a lot of uh, equally weighted ETFs, so they'll just take the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 and weight each one at 0.2% of, of that ETF. And, and the huge ETF issuers have those out there for sale. Um, there's some in, inverse uh, weighted ETFs. There's a pretty unique one from a company called um, Exponential ETFs where they reverse cap weight. The uh, stocks in the S&P 500, I believe, is the index they use. So the bottom 10 or 20 or 50 stocks get a much higher weight than the top 5 or 20 or 50 stocks. Now, again, all these strategies that I'm talking about, none of them has done, has done as well as the broad index in the last 5 or 10 years because of the trend that we've seen in the top stocks pulling the pulling the most weight. But when that trend no longer persists, you'll be really happy if you used some of these other options that I'm that I'm mentioning in your investment portfolio. So there are my thoughts on the current state of indexed funds or ETFs that are available for investors out there. To summarize it, I think they're good options, but they are um, misleading people in terms of what they're getting when they invest in them. And especially with recent performance, they are being uh, led to believe that they have the best investment option out there. And I don't think that's always going to remain to be true. So if you're using any of those investments, I encourage you to seriously consider what's under the hood of what you're putting your money in and decide if just keeping those is right for you or if you want to further diversify from there. So let me know in the comments if anyone else has been seeing the same things or if you have any cool examples of how this has applied over history or if you totally disagree with me let me know that too um, feel free to like the video subscribe to the channel if you appreciate the content and uh, thanks for watching